Stephen Anderson and His Lies, Part 15. Uh, yes, Stephen Anderson actually believes and teaches that all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the nation of Israel were all fulfilled before Jesus Christ even came to the earth. Let's watch the first video clip. You're going to believe some of the stuff he says in this one. Now, Christians will also repeat this. And in fact, you almost hear this more from Christians than Jews. Christians will tell you, hey, God promised them that land. That land belongs to them. They have a right to that land according to Scripture. Well, that is a lie. Because the Bible is very clear that that promise of that land unto the Jews was always conditional upon their faith and obedience to God. Okay. The promise there was always conditional on their faith and obedience to God. So let's look in the Bible here. Psalm 94, verse 14. We're going to hit a couple scriptures here. And I'm going to show you this thing because he's going to be saying it in some upcoming video clips I'm going to play here that all the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled by the time Jesus Christ showed up on the earth. And Jesus was totally done with the nation of Israel. So here we have Psalm 94. We're going to go down here to verse 14. For the Lord will not cast off his people, people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. I want you to notice something. I talked about this in one of my sermons right there. His inheritance. Who's the his in the verse there? The Lord. You see, part of the promise there of the nation of Israel is there's a special city in the nation of Israel called Jerusalem. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus Christ calls it the city of the great king. You see, that city and the reign from that city is the inheritance that's promised to Jesus Christ, to the Lord. Interesting. Very interesting. Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from that city. And by the way, if you're a Jew, what is the Lord's inheritance there? Does the Lord come down to the earth in the form of a man? Something you ought to think about. Go next to Psalm 105. A lot of the Jews believe that their Messiah is just going to be a man, a regular man. Well, it's kind of a bad Savior for you there. Psalm 105, verse 5, here through 11. It says, Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant uh, as long as they were in belief, um, as long as they had faith, uh, as long as they attended uh, Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Oh, no, I'm sorry it doesn't say that. It says uh, forever. Unless you're Stephen Anderson, then forever can mean a, a period of time, forever as long as you're believing. It's not what it says. And you say, well, but, but you see, it's been done away with. Let's keep reading. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Now, there's a lot of different debate over the, what a generation is in the Bible. But let's just go with the number 20, because I think most people could agree that that would be about the time that it would take a child to grow up and have children. Okay? Some people might say 30, some might say 40, even more than that, whatever. But let's just go with 20. Let's go with a low number. What would a thousand generations be if one generation is 20? That would be 20,000 years. So the covenant there, he remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Has the world been around for 20,000 years? Especially if you go back to the covenant that was made between God and Abraham. Has it been 20,000 years since then? No. Then the covenant must still be binding. Yeah. Verse 9, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and into and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. 
physical real estate promised by an everlasting covenant that will not be disannulled for at least a bare minimum of 20,000 years. God promised it. You say, well, why? I don't understand why Stephen Anderson couldn't see such clear scriptures. Oh, well, for the same reason that all Roman Catholics don't see the clear scriptures, because they don't want to. You know, it's been well said. It's kind of like they, you know, they don't want to find God for the same reason or obey God for the same reason a thief doesn't want to find a police officer. You see, the Roman Catholics want to steal that land. They want that land for themselves because right now the Catholic Church, it's a political organization and it always has been. You know, I've, I've taught this thing for quite a few years now and that is I don't believe that the fifth kingdom, you know, you see the prophecy in the book of Daniel about these five kingdoms and it starts out with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold. You know, it goes on down through and it ends up with, you know, the, the feet, part of iron, part of miry clay. And people say, well, that kingdom is the one that's coming in the future. You had the two legs of, of iron there, the, you know, the, diff, the two different kingdoms of Rome, the iron legions of Rome, and now that fifth kingdom is eventually going to come. And we're in this somehow this kind of a period between the two, the kingdom of Rome and the kingdom of the ten. I don't believe that way. I believe that this ten-toed kingdom has been in existence since about, what, maybe two, three hundred A.D., somewhere in there, when the Catholic Church was falling and reestablished itself, reemerged. Well, I shouldn't say the Catholic Church. The Roman Empire was falling and it reemerged as the Roman Catholic system there, the Roman Catholic Church. I believe we've been in the fifth kingdom ever since that time back then. You don't have to agree with that, but whatever. You know, the whole point is this covenant has not been disannulled. It has not gone away. But the Catholics want that land. They want control of all lands. They want control of everything. But especially that land where Jesus Christ is physically going to return and rule and reign from that city. And the Antichrist, who will be tied in with Catholicism, uh, he is going to rule and reign there in Jerusalem because he counterfeits everything that the Lord does. That's the way Satan's always done it. You know, you got to understand that. But let's go next to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. See, these are the kind of scriptures that people like Anderson just don't like to talk about. Ezekiel 36, verse 21. There you can see chapter 36 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Okay, now, if you remember what Stephen Anderson said, he said that this land, this land that's promised and things, has always been conditional on their belief. Right there, obviously, in verse 21, the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen the name of God. So they weren't believing in this passage here. It's not referring to a believing saved Israel. Look at verse 22. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. You see? That's God's future plans. The nation of Israel has been brought back to their land again. Their language has been restored. And you can say, well, you know, yes, but that was the way it was there in, in the time of Jesus. No, it wasn't. They were under Roman ca captivity. The Jews didn't have their own you know, nation and their own laws and things back then. No, they didn't. That's why they had to go to, you know, Pilate and things to have Jesus executed, you know, because they didn't have the right to do that themselves. They weren't in control. See? But they are now. The nation of Israel does have its own government, does have its own leaders and everything else. And they weren't brought back in belief. That's what the Bible says would happen. But let's continue here. Verse, verse uh, 
24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Wait a second. I thought that the land was conditional. You know, they get the land only when they're obeying and believing and stuff. Uh-uh. They're brought back in unbelief. They're profaning God's name. And God says it's their land. Get a hold of that thing, okay? We'll bring you into your own land. That's what it says right there. Look at verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God." I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call uh, for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and the increase of the field, and ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Notice this, no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Okay, now we're going to see here in the upcoming video clips, Anderson tries to say that this all happened before Jesus Christ showed up on the earth. It's really kind of weird, you know, the first time there. Really kind of weird, why would Jesus Christ come and offer the kingdom if the kingdom had already come and gone? And it's saying there, you know, uh, no more reproach of, of famine among the heathen. It's not going to happen anymore. Okay, well, it has. <laughs> See, really, really messed up. This is a, f a future prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. We're in the beginning of it being fulfilled. The nation of Israel has been brought back to their land. That's true. But the full fulfillment of this is going to be when you get through the time of Jacob's trouble and Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom on the earth. Read about that in Matthew chapter 25. But let's continue. Verse 31. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations... Interesting. How could you loathe them? How could they loathe themselves for their iniquities and abominations if they weren't committing any? You know, if they were brought back to the land in belief and they're holy, righteous people and all this other stuff. You know. Um, verse 32. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places, and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the flock, as the holy flock, um, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay. Now, you're going to see it here that Anderson says this already took place. Let's watch. If they keep his covenant. Well, we know that they did not keep his covenant because in Hebrews chapter 8, the Bible tells us, They continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So in the Old Testament, God had a covenant or an agreement or promises unto the nation of Israel that had some ifs associated with them. If you continue in the covenant, if you obey my voice, we know from Hebrews, we know from reading the Old Testament that the children of Israel broke that covenant, did not hear his voice, did not obey him. And because of that, the Bible told them, you know, that the kingdom of God would be taken from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, he tells us who that holy nation is, that peculiar people. It's those who in time past were not a people. 
It's just a nation made up of all believers that now comprise the people of God in the New Testament. The, the nation of Israel is no longer regarded as God's chosen. Okay. I wanted to play that one before I play some of the other ones where he's saying the Old Testament prophecies are all fulfilled. But it's very important to understand this. He says there in this thing about in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, it says, uh, Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now does it say that? Yeah, it does. But you got to look at context. This is why uh, old Stephen Andersnake doesn't like to uh, doesn't like to look at context. He doesn't notice he didn't tell you in that video clip right there. You can go back and watch it again. He doesn't tell you what verse. He just says Hebrews chapter eight. He doesn't tell you it's verse nine. Let's go down here, verse nine. It says, "Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand." to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So this is a part right here that he quotes. But look at verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will, will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Why didn't he read the whole context of that? Because what it's saying is, God has made a covenant, the Old Testament there basically, the, a lot of the Old Testament was about God dealing specifically with the nation of Israel for a physical piece of real estate, land over there. Okay, the nation of Israel. That's what the Old Testament's all about. And because the Lord, you know, offered himself to them, came in the flesh, God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and he offered himself as their king, and they said, we don't want you as our king. And so that earthly kingdom was put off for a while, because you see, every single time you have a king in the Old Testament, you might have a good one like King David. Then King Solomon comes along and he's doing good, then he marries strange wives, they turn away his heart, and he falls apart. And you have, you know, and then it's just like king after king after king. This one's good, then that one's bad. This one brings it back, and then this one ruins it again. So what does the nation of Israel need? They need God as their king, physically on the earth. And the Old Testament talks about that. And we're going to look about that too. You know, I want to go back actually and show you that right now. Because I forgot to look at this one. Zechariah chapter 12 But rather interesting that Stephen Anderson would conveniently not tell you where the verses are in Hebrews chapter 8. Because you'd go to it and you'd read it and you'd realize this has to be the Jews. You know, this has to be promises to the nation of Israel. He doesn't want you to know that. Okay. Here we are in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel... Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it pretty much being fulfilled today. Verse 4, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. And that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, wood and like a to torch of fire in a sheaf, 
and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Has this happened? Yes, yes, it's happened right now. Verse 7, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, and the glory of the house of David, and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them, as that day shall in that, at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of, angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Okay, again, let me stop. Did this happen before Jesus showed up on the earth? No, no. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Wait a second. This happened before Jesus Christ showed up the first time then how can the inhabitants of Jerusalem look upon him whom they've pierced when they haven't pierced him yet? You see the mess these guys get themselves into? These replacement theology heretics? They shall look upon me whom they've pierced before he was pierced. Right, 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 right. Verse 11, In that day shall there be a great morning in Jerusalem as the morning of Had Hadad Rimon, in the valley of Megiddon, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Why is there mourning? Because they're looking upon him whom they've pierced, and they realize all those years, we rejected Jesus Christ. And here he is. He's our Messiah. He's our King. And it lines up. This lines up perfectly with Romans chapter 11. You've got to understand that. If you're Jewish and you're going, well, you know, I believe in the Old Testament, but I don't believe in the New Testament, compare the two. Open your mind a little bit. Do a little bit of study. And you'll see the prophecies here are lining up with Romans chapter 11. But see, it's far easier to go and look for heretics like Stephen Anderson that are attacking the Jewish people and to say, well, see, there you go. It's Christianity for you. A lot easier to do that than to actually read the New Testament and compare the New Testament with the Old Testament. The prophecies back here line up with the New Testament. And there are thousands of prophecies in the New Testament. I heard Rabbi Mordecai Kraft say the one time, saw a little bit of one video and he said that there's only one prophecy in the entire New Testament and it failed. Um, sorry there, you're quite ignorant. There are thousands of prophecies. Okay? Many, many of them. And they all line up with the Old Testament. Well, let's go on to the next clip here from uh, Stephen Andersnake. Oh, did I say snake? I, I meant Anderson. My mistake. And a lot of people who fail to rightly divide the word of truth, they'll quote Old Testament scriptures like this and try to apply them to the current modern-day Christ-rejecting nation of Israel or to modern-day so-called Jews and say they are the apple of God's eye. If you touch them, you're touching the apple of God's eye and God's going to punish you. You need to seek their good and so forth. Now, of course, like I said, these people are just stuck under the old covenant. They don't realize that the kingdom of God was taken from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, and that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. But what's interesting about this is that the teaching that applies this Old Testament scripture from Zechariah 2, 7 and 8, onto modern-day Jews doesn't come from the New Testament. It actually comes from the Talmud, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. But first of all, let me show you the context. It says in verse 7, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. 
So this is being spoken while Jews are in Babylon, in the Babylonian captivity. And he's talking about the fact that when Babylon had attacked them and, and taken them into captivity and people are continuing to treat them poorly, that they're touching the apple of God's eye. That's back when the Jews were still God's chosen people because it's back in the Old Testament. Okay, well, you know, we're in the New Testament now. This scripture is not relevant to a Christ-rejecting nation that is no longer God's chosen people. They're not the apple of his eye. We as believers, we as Christians are the apple. Isn't that funny? <laughs> you know, people like me, you know, we don't rightly divide the word of truth. You know, dispensational preachers don't rightly divide the word of truth. Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. I mean, talk about some Jesuitical double think there. You know, um, those people, the dispensationalists, they rightly divide the word of truth. They are guilty of not rightly dividing the word of truth. This from the guy that proudly boasts on his website, you know, we are non-dispensational, you know. <laughs> but he's the one that rightly divides the word of truth and dispensationalists don't. Sure, sure. But, you know, you saw it there. He's, makes, he's saying that the things that were happening there, it's in the Babylonian captivity, so this is all Old Testament. And back in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was God's chosen people, but now they aren't anymore. You know, just replacement theology. This guy's a Catholic. But let's watch the next one. And then in 1948, they all believed on Jesus Christ, and that's why they're back in the promised land today, because they have turned unto the Lord with all their heart. You know that isn't true. So how can people say, oh, God brought them back to the promised land? How can people say that uh, God brought them back to the promised land? Well, we just read about it there in Ezekiel chapter 36. God says, you've profaned my name among the heathen, but I'm going to bring you back to your land, your land, you know, because of my name's sake. The Bible plainly teaches that God brought the Jews back to the nation of Israel there, brought them back, scattered among all different nations and things out there, and God says, go on back. God brought them back for His own sake, for His name's sake. Anderson says, Who can say, how can you even say that? Oh, well, we can say it because we believe the Bible, unlike Anderson. Let's watch the next one here. The Christians will teach today that they are in the promised land as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy when God said he would bring them from all nations. Now, here's what boggles my mind. People fail to rightly divide the word. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's a good way to divide the word. Old Testament and New Testament. That's a great way to divide the word. But not only that, <laughs> Isn't that classic? You know, people fail to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, and then he quotes 2 Timothy 2.15. And yet he is non-dispensational. Hello? You know? And here's a good way to, to, to divide the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. Um, okay. And yet you look at Stephen Anderson, what he teaches, he teaches salvation's always been the same. There's always been eternal security. There always will be eternal security. The gospel's always been the same. You know, he's got, you know, Adam and Eve believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Thousands of years before Jesus Christ even showed up on the earth to die on the cross. You know, these non-dispensational guys are kooky. But then he, he spins it around and, oh, you know, we rightly divide the word of truth, but them dispensational people, they don't. This guy's a nut. But now listen, he actually is going to go on here and openly say that all the Old Testament prophecies about the restoration of Israel, they all happened before Jesus Christ shows up on the earth. I mean, do you realize the theological wreck that this causes? Jesus Christ comes and he says, here I am, here are the, you know, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom. Why is he preaching the physical kingdom? It's already been restored. It's all, or already been fulfilled, excuse me, all in the past. It's all done. It's all over. Why did Jesus Christ even come to the earth? You know, oh, to, that's right, to, uh, to die on the cross so that he could replace Israel. Let's watch. 
You will have people today that will quote things from Jeremiah and Ezekiel about them coming back from all the nations where they'd been scattered, and they'll say that's what happened in 1948. Otherwise, where's the fulfillment of this prophecy? Here's what people don't understand. They don't realize that when Jeremiah is speaking in the book of Jeremiah, they were just about to go into captivity with Nebuchadnezzar. They hadn't even done that yet. And when Ezekiel is speaking, they had just gone into that captivity. So both Jeremiah and Ezekiel are speaking at the beginning of that Babylonian captivity or shortly before that Babylonian captivity. And so, of course, there are all kinds of prophecies saying, I'm going to bring you back from the nations where you've been scattered. That's what he did 70 years later. Those prophecies have already been fulfilled t over 2,500 years ago. Those prophecies were fulfilled long before the time of Christ. But people say, oh yeah, this is of today. This is being fulfilled right now in the 20th century with the rebirth of the nation of Israel. It's a fulfillment of God's prophecy to bring them back from all nations. No, that was a prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar's captivity and them coming back from that. Okay, so again, failure to rightly divide like things that happened thousands of years ago and things that are happening today. Big difference. This guy, I'll tell you what. It already happened. It's all back there. In, you know, the things in Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel, it was all about the Babylonian captivity. It all happened before Jesus Christ showed up on the earth. Ezekiel 36. There we have Ezekiel 36. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. All countries. Well, praise the Lord. This was back before the Babylonian captivity. So you had all the Jews there living in New York City and you had the ones out in California and you had some that were living over here. And they were living in all countries, weren't they? You see the kooky nonsense that Stephen Anderson is preaching here? It's ridiculous. Oh, they were in all countries before the Babylonian captivity. No, they weren't. Give me a break. They're in all countries today. And when the nation of Israel was formed, they were literally scattered all over the place, the Jews. You know, especially after World War II. I mean, for crying out loud, running away from the Nazi, you know, the whole satanic Nazi movement that came from Catholicism that Anderson is now working for. This guy's a wingnut. I'll tell you what. Let's watch the next clip here. And here he's going to say that there's really nothing in the New Testament that uh, talks about, you know, Israel coming back. Let's watch. Why can't they show us New Testament scriptures of the children of Israel coming back from all nations? Because it's not of the New Testament. That's why. Now they'll say, oh, what about the 144,000? Oh, we'll, we'll go there. Okay. And of course, if you've seen my video on the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, Stephen Andrew Snake tries to say, oh, there I went and said snake again. <laughs> Anderson here, he, um, he tries to say that the 144,000 are Old Testament Jews, which is really stupid because God's saying, don't hurt the earth till we've sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. But Anderson says, well, don't hurt the earth because we've got to seal people up here in heaven. Yeah. But he says, why don't they show us some New Testament scriptures that talk about Israel returning to their land? Okay, um, Matthew chapter 24. Did that take place before Jesus Christ showed up on the earth? Uh, obviously not, because Jesus is prophesying the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world. You know, He's prophesying that. Um, read Matthew chapter 24. Let them which be in Judea, when ye see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Okay, Matthew chapter 24 is about the nation of Israel. How about the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11 being killed in the streets of Jerusalem? How could they be killed in the streets of Jerusalem if the nation of Israel doesn't exist in the future. The nation that's over there right now is not really Israel, even though it's named Israel. And the city of Jerusalem is not Jerusalem, even though it's named Jerusalem. 
Yeah. How about the book of James written to the 12 tribes? Uh, do you ever hear of the book of Hebrews? If you're dispensational, you know that a lot of the stuff that's going on in those two books, James and Hebrews there, a lot of the stuff that's going on is going to be taking place in the time of Jacob's trouble. A lot of that doctrine that you see in those two books. Oh, there's nothing clearly talking about, you know, prophecies for the future and things, you know, in the New Testament for the nation of Israel. Sure there is. Unless you're dishonest, like Anderson. Go next in your Bible to Romans chapter 11. Okay, so Anderson said, all the things, all the prophecies in the Old Testament about Israel being restored as a nation and everything, it's already been fulfilled by the time Jesus showed up on the earth, and we can't prove any New Testament scriptures that show future plans for the nation of Israel. That's what he said. Romans chapter 11, and we're going to verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Huh? What? Well, it's already taken place before Jesus showed up. What's it talking about here? The fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles? How much more their fullness? You mean a future event? Sure. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. Who is this talking about? Jews. For if the casting away of them, see the them? Same thing there. Jews. Jews. The casting away of the Jews, there, them, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Uh, future plans for the nation of Israel. Okay? I don't understand how Anderson can't get a hold of this stuff. Oh, I mean, if he was honest, which he's not. That explains it. But uh, verse 25, jump down here. It says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant, like we read earlier, everlasting covenant, the one which he commanded to a thousand generations there, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Notice again that it's God that's doing this. I shall take away their sins. You've profaned my name, and for my sake, I'm not doing this for your sake. Ezekiel chapter 36, he's saying this. He's saying, I'm doing this for my name's sake. It's my inheritance, the Lord's inheritance. So when Anderson comes along and he says, oh, that stuff is all a lie. It's all, it's all not true. What's he saying? He's stealing from God. Calling God a liar, actually, if you really want to get down to it. Turn back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. I want to show you these verses again one more time. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. Again, here we have Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Sounds like all Israel being saved there again. And you say, but Brian, this all happened in the first century. You know, this all happened before Jesus, not the first century. It all happened before Jesus Christ even showed up. Babylonian captivity. Then why are they writing about it after Jesus Christ has ascended back up to heaven? See how little sense this makes? If you're an Andersonite and you still have some common sense left, 
Let's go on to the next clip here. There's no promise that's just an unconditional promise that says all of the physical descendants of Abraham, all of the Jews or all of the Israelites have this land. Uh, it's for them no matter what they do, no matter how blasphemous they are, no matter what sins they commit. That's not true. And if that were true, if God really made a promise like that, then he's broken it many times by kicking them out of that land. Again, openly denying the word of God. I mean, I showed you plain scriptures saying it's their land. You know, whether or not they believe it's eventually going to be their land and it will be their land when Jesus Christ the King returns to rule and reign there. That will be when the final fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, and right now the fullness of the Gentiles is ending. Okay, right now God's dealing with the Gentile nations is starting to come to a close. And it says in the, in the Bible that he's going to make a full end of all nations, but not a full end of the nation of Israel. That's coming in the future. Let's watch the next video here. And these dispensationalists always say, you know, there are a lot of Old Testament promises to Israel that God still has to fulfill. It's all been fulfilled unto that physical nation, and they've been rejected. I thought Anderson was a dispensationalist here, because he said earlier to rightly divide the word of truth. Well, that's right, though. You can rightly divide the word of truth, but not be dispensational. He's nuts. And again, you heard him openly say, all the Old Testament prophecies have been fulfilled. So when Jesus Christ showed up, according to Zechariah chapter 12, he shows up and the Jews look at him and they say, well, look at those hands that you've been, you know, we've pierced and everything. But see, you would actually have had to have Jesus showed up before that because Andersnake said that all the prophecies were fulfilled before Jesus Christ showed up, which is really kind of interesting because if you have Jesus Christ coming back and they look at his hands that they've pierced, you know, how could that have happened before he even showed up on the earth for the first time? You know, there should uh, be a little neon sign up here on uh, Anderson's head that says vacancy. Nobody's home. Watch the next video. Basically, all the believers that are the spiritual seed of Abraham and even, even many of the physical seed of Abraham that are believers are going to inherit this land in the millennial reign of Christ and also in the new heaven and new earth will inherit all things. That's why it says it's an everlasting possession and it's a land that he'll inherit forever. But to try to apply these forever, everlasting Abraham and his seed promises unto the Jews of today is a false doctrine. It is, it is to totally misunderstand the whole history of the nation of Israel, which is a history of being removed from the land when they don't believe and being brought back when they do believe. Do the Jews today believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Why did he kick them out? Because they rejected Christ. So why would he bring them back when they still reject Christ? It makes absolutely zero sense. It makes absolutely zero sense. Well, if you're a Roman Catholic replacement theology, you know, heretic, then yes, it wouldn't make any sense to you because that's your land that you're trying to steal over there, you know, because you are inspired by the spirit of Satan, you know. But again, what about Ezekiel chapter 36, where it clearly says, God is saying, you profane my name among the heathen, but I'm going to bring you back for my name's sake. What about that? Well, that's right, that all happened in the past, and sure. Two more video clips to watch here, and then we're done with this one. Israel. Now, there's a bunch of people over in Israel today that call themselves citizens of Israel. I say they're a bunch of foreigners over there, a bunch of strangers and aliens. Why? Because they're not made nigh by the blood of Christ. In God's eyes, they're not of Israel because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Those natural branches have been broken off, and we've been grafted in. I find it interesting a lot of times while he's talking, he's going like this with his right arm, talking like that. I see that over and over and over again in his videos. He'll do this. I'm sure there's no tie-in to Nazi philosophy or anything else there. Of course not. But uh, he says there that the natural branches have been broken off. Again, 
he doesn't read the context. He won't quote the context. So just talk about that. Romans chapter 11, look at verse 17. There you have chapter 11, verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest, standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. It's a very da dangerous thing to mess around with the nation of Israel. I mean, our whole book, our whole Bible here comes from the Jewish people. Our Savior was Jewish. Everything, our future, everything is dependent upon God's prophecies being fulfilled in the nation of Israel. There's so much that's tied into that whole thing. And that's why the Bible warns right here, you better not mess with the nation of Israel. And, and you know, as a Bible-believing Christian, why would you even want to? It doesn't even make any sense. It's not logical. You know, to single out one people out there and just, you know, Anderson's the wicked Jews, the synagogue of Satan, and they're horrible, and they're wicked, and they're evil, and they reject Jesus, and they have sodomy, and they're all this other. What about the Japanese? What about the Koreans? What about the Africans? What about the, the British? What about the Americans? You know, why single out the Jewish people? See, it's not even natural. It's not even, it's not even a logical thing where you can say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, it's totally satanic. But let's watch one more video clip here, and then we'll be done with this one. Okay, here we go. We could go all over the Old Testament to show you that the promises of children of Israel to be brought back to the land are all conditional upon their faith and obedience. Okay. So again, we have the promises that God made to the nation of Israel. They're all conditional. Uh, no, they're not. And just a plain understanding of Scripture, uh, I've preached about it. A lot of other brethren have looked at this thing and shown it and, and everything else. It just, you know, it's it's Anderson and his camp. It's just kind of like they're, they kind of put their hands up and say, hey, don't confuse me with facts, okay? We prefer our emotions and our Catholic fantasies and everything else. You know, don't quote scripture at us because we'll just find other scriptures that we can twist and pervert and, you know, because we will not accept the plain teachings of scripture. That yes, God has a plan for the nation of Israel. God has future promises. Promises that are being fulfilled and ones that are yet to come to pass. And the greatest promise of all is Jesus Christ coming back. Zechariah chapter 12. Okay, that event has not happened yet. And those Jews, and if you're out there watching and you are a Jewish person from the nation of Israel, again, like I've said in other videos, I'm not your enemy, and Bible-believing Christians are not your enemy. Your enemy is Roman Catholics that call themselves Christians. That's your enemy. Okay, They're the ones that are going to kill you. Right? They're the ones that are going to be coming to torture you and to put you in concentration camps that are going to make Nazi Germany look like a nice little picnic in the park. Right? Those are the ones that you need to watch out for, not people like me. But you got to understand, Jesus Christ, your Messiah, already came. And when he shows up again in the future, you're going to look at those hands that were pierced, that he hung there on that cross and died for your sins. And you're going to mourn. If you make it through that time, if you don't, if you don't get saved before the catching away of the body of Christ, and we leave, and you go into that time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to go through the worst time period on earth. And if, if you survive, okay, if you survive and you come out at the other end of that thing, you're going to see Jesus Christ show up, and you're going to see those two nail prints right there in his hands. And you're going to realize it was all true. That New Testament was true. But your odds of surviving that time are not very good. Most of the Jewish people are going to get slaughtered in that time because the Catholics are going to be taken over. And they are taking over, by the way. They're taking parts of the city of Jerusalem right now, having agreements and things like this that they can come in and set up their temples and whatever else. You're in very serious danger. And if you're watching Stephen Anderson out there, 
anybody who calls themselves a Christian, you're watching Steven Anderson, you're in real serious danger too. Run away from his ministry, I'm telling you. It's bad, and I'm going to be showing more proof here in the next couple videos. Thank you for watching.